So, welcome to week 8 of Strength of Materials. So, today we will deal with the method of redundant forces and moments, which expands on what we did last time. And it's actually the last week of the beam theory. And next week, week 9, we'll be uh, dealing with composite beams. First, a little bit of practical information. Uh, since quite a lot of people from the class have left Denmark and we don't know if they can return uh, during the semester, we will continue these voiceover lectures and also the hand-in of uh, weekly exercises. About exam, this is yet unknown how that will be done in practice, but I'm sure we will find a solution and I'm pretty sure that DTU will do everything possible to uh, help people take their exams abroad, but I cannot expand on that at this moment. As I said, uh, today we'll be uh, expanding on what we did last time. So the method of redundant forces, moments, actually builds on the superposition principle that we introduced last time. And we also saw that we could use the, uh, the superposition principle in order to determine reaction forces in the case where we had statically indeterminate systems. So. There is a general method, and we will expand on that today. The first step will be to, given that we have a statically indeterminate system, we will obtain a statically determinant principal system by removing as many geometrical constraints as we have the degrees of statical inter indeterminacy. And we will see examples today, both of first order and second order statically uh, indeterminate systems. So uh, when we do that, when we remove uh, the geometrical constraints, then we will add the corresponding reaction forces uh, or actually also internal forces, also a possibility, uh, the same number as we have, uh, uh, and we will add them as redundant loads. So we will see examples of that. Then the second step uh, of the solution procedure is to determine these redundant loads. So uh, we have now introduced the, for instance, the reaction forces, which are unknown. We have uh, replaced them with an unknown redundant load, and we will determine these redundant loads in order to actually fulfill the geometrical constraints. So in the bottom here, uh, we see an example of such a case here. Uh, we have a system that is one time statically indeterminate, and how can we see that it's one time statically indeterminate? Well, we count the number of unknown reaction forces. And we see here at the left boundary, we have a clamp support. And in a clamp support, we generally have three unknown support reactions, vertical horizontal forces, and a moment. In addition to that, at the right boundary here, we have a simple support where we have one unknown reaction force. Uh, Actually, it's a rolling support we can see here. So we have uh, one unknown reaction force, and that is the vertical uh, reaction force. So altogether, we have four unknown reaction forces, which is one time statically indeterminate because we have only three equilibrium conditions uh, that has to be fulfilled. So what we do now, and we did not see, uh, do this in this way last time, we actually... Uh, make it a little bit more formal. So we introduce like almost a, a recipe on how to solve these problems. So we will now define or divide our system into what we call the zero system or the base system. And that after we have chosen which unknown reaction force to uh, remove, and we will now choose this one to remove. Well, then we define our zero system as the system with that reaction uh, or that uh, unknown reaction uh, removed. So we have removed the support over here at the right boundary, but we have here still the external load uh, acting. So that will be our zero system. And it, uh, the, the principle or the idea about this zero system is that it's a statically determinate system so we can solve the system. Now, in addition to the zero system, we will have as many extra systems as the degree of statically indeterminacy. And in this case, we have one time statically indeterminate system where we have the 
reaction force in B removed. So our one system or first system here will be to add that uh, corresponding load in this time, a vertical force in the place where we have the, uh, the support. But now we do not uh, include uh, the external load because we have that already uh, present in the zero system. So our uh, one system, our first system, will now be uh, with the external uh, redundant load X. So now written a little bit more in a formal way here, uh, the zero system, or we also call the principal system, it is the st statically determinant system obtained after the removal of the geometrical constraints. And we have n systems, which uh, from one and upwards, by removing, well, we remove all external loads, as we could see here, we don't include the external loads in the extra systems, but we apply then only one by one the redundant loads that we have introduced by, uh, while well, removing the geometrical constraints. Now written up uh, a little bit uh, for the system here, uh, we will actually see that there are actually several ways of choosing how to remove uh, one geometrical constraint. There is maybe for this case, which is actually also the case that we looked at last week, there is the obvious way, and we will repeat that, how it's done because it's really important, but there is also alternative ways of doing it. So now let's first do it again uh, the obvious way. Let's take a look here. So we will just repeat actually what we did last time from last week. So how do we solve this system? Let's, now let's first uh, take it step by step how we would do it. So we take our system as it looks and then we say, okay, we will, oops, we will split it up into the first system. Oh, sorry, uh, the zero system or the principal system. And that was we would remove uh, the geometrical constraint, and we will choose that to be the uh, rolling support at the right end. So thereby having a statically determined system that we can solve by looking up in the elementary cases. And that is the whole idea. And then we have, so this will be our zero system. And when you solve problems, uh, it's a good idea to write this up. Uh, so it's pretty clear what you, uh, in that case, what you're doing. Now we have to add the first system. Now we just introduced the uh, A and B notation for the two points, the left uh, point and the right point here. Now, in the, in the slides and also in the book, they call this redundant load, in this case, X. I really do like to call it by its name, that it is the vertical reaction force from the, unknowns, from the unknown vertical reaction force at point B. We will just treat it as a force, a known force uh, in, the first, in the first case. And then we will solve for this unknown force by uh, enforcing the geometrical constraints afterwards. So this is the uh, first step, and as you have seen, this is sort of the straightforward or the obvious way to choose the redundant load and the removal of the geometrical constraint. Now the second step is to use the elementary cases. Now, first we have, of course, to identify uh, which elementary cases can apply in this system. So we have the zero system and the one system, and we have to find the corresponding elementary cases that goes with these uh, systems. Now let's look back. I put in the elementary cases here. It's not in the slides I've uploaded, but you have it on the slides from the previous week. So first, of course, is uh, you have to identify uh, uh, the correct boundary conditions. So this set of uh, cases here are for the clamp beam. And as we saw, we need the seventh one because that's when where we have the distributed uh, uniform load. And then we need uh, the elementary case where we have a point force and that's number six. So let's just write this. So it's um, 
elementary case 7 plus elementary case 6. Now what we need to do now is, uh, well, what we're after is to write up the uh, the deflection curve for the whole beam. That's what we take as our, our main task here. So let's just uh, look up in the elementary cases what the deflection curve looks like. So for the uh, distributed load, we have the deflection curve given here. Now always remember that these elementary cases can only be used if we have constant bending stiffness, right? So if we do not have bending stiffness, then we simply have to solve the differential equations also in this case. So we can also use this method of redundant loads moments with so by solving the differential equations to get the deflection curves. But of course, it's much more easy if we have uh, constant bending stiffness so we can use the elementary cases. Now see, I call it W0 in order to uh, refer to the zero system. Now taking the formula from the previous page, we get the following expression. Remember, psi uh, measures the dimensionless coordinate ranging from 0 to 1, corresponding to x going from 0 to l. Now, this is the uh, deflection curve that we're ultimately interested in obtaining for the combined problem, and not only for the zero system. Uh, so we can also write up for the one system. And here we have to identify... Uh, this problem, the six elementary case, and here we have this expression for the deflection curve. Now, in addition to just stating that, we need to identify what alpha is, and alpha indicates where the load is positioned. And here we can see that we have, in our case, we have F, or the load, acting uh, at the rightmost point, so alpha is equal to 1. And that also means that we, when we evaluate our funny bracket over here, Looking at the definition in the bottom, we can see since alpha is 1, our xi will always be less than or equal to uh, alpha, meaning that the, the bracket will, in this case, be 0. So, inserting that, and remembering one extra thing, because see here, we have by pointing upwards, and we have to remember that looking at the elementary case, our f is pointing downwards, so we need just to change our sign in our force. So this will be minus by, and then we get L3, and just copying the formula from the elementary case. So now in principle, by adding these two formulas, we can express our total deflection curve. However, of course, the point is here that we still do not know by. And the method to get by, or to find by, is to enforce this geometrical constraint that we have removed. So the geometrical constraint is that the deflection at point B is equal to zero, because we know we have a support there. We have just temporarily removed it in order to, well, establish this method. Uh, but by enforcing that the uh, deflection is zero at B, we can use this to define By or find By. So what we do need to do first, of course, is to evaluate the deflection at point B. So this is going to be our second step in this, in this uh, well, our second step here. So let us just evaluate for xi equal to 1, so simply inserting, and doing that we get q0 
L to the power of 4 divided by 8. And for the second case, get E, the bending stiffness, again evaluated at psi equal to 1, we get minus By L to the power of 3 divided by 3. And now we enforce the geometrical constraint. So we enforce that our w psi equal to 1 equal to 0, meaning that the sum of our two individual deflection expressions evaluated at psi equal to 1 must be equal to 0. And that's quite easy to enforce because, of course, over here we have the expressions our EY or EI, we can just leave here. Uh, this is just a constant, the bending stiffness. So what that gives us is that Q0 L4 divided by 8 becomes equal to BY L3 divided by 3 or BY equals to 3Q0 L divided by 8. Now this was only the, uh, yeah, you can say this was the second step. We have used or enforced the geometrical constraint in order to find our unknown reaction force B. And now we can use that in order to obtain our total uh, deflection curve. So we simply add these two expressions together with the specific value for by inserted. So here I have inserted in this expression, I've inserted by with this expression. So totally I get this. And then I have to remember the parenthesis. And finally, I can add these two expressions together in order to simplify my expression. And finally, this is my final expression for the deflection curve. Now you can perhaps say that this way of splitting it up is the most, well, it's the most obvious choice of choosing the redundant load and the, in the geometrical constraint which we remove simply to remove the, uh, the rolling support at B and introducing it as the, uh, the force BY here. But it is not the only choice. <clears throat> And for other systems, it might be handy to have these additional tools uh, or additional techniques available. So I will just show you how we could actually choose uh, to remove another geometric constraint and to enforce another redundant load or moment. Now we take the alternative approach here. So how could we also treat the system? 
Well, what we could do is say, okay, so what do we know about yeah, clamp support? Well, there are actually uh, three uh, support reactions. We have the vertical, we have the horizontal forces, and we have uh, the bending moment uh, as the support reactions. So what about introducing the moment uh, at the uh, support, at the clamp support? We have the two uh, A and B points here. Well, what about uh, just introducing the moment at A as the redundant load? So what would it look like if we do that? Well, at B, of course, we still have now the support. We also still have the external load here, Q0. This is our zero system. So what happens at A if we, uh, if we now remove the geometrical constraint associated with the redundant moment uh, MA? Well, if we remove the geometrical constraint uh, associated with a moment, which is the rotation, then we actually change our boundary condition from a clamp support to a simple support. Like this. So this will be our zero system. So we have changed our clamp support into a simple support by removing the geometrical constraint of rotation. But this means we then had to add the redundant, the system with the redundant moment. So this is actually a completely different way of tackling the problem. Uh, and it is, of course, uh, at first glimpse, not as straightforward and it doesn't look as obvious as the other choice. But let's just take it through and see that we actually get the same result. So first, of course, we have to find the appropriate elementary cases for this system. And we can see here we are now, both for our zero system and our first system, we are here with other boundary conditions. So we have to look up in, in the other table. So let's go back. So it's not on this page. Instead, it's on this page where we have the uh, simple supports. So we have our elementary case two here for a uniform distributed load. And we have our elementary case uh, one here, which is, uh, no, sorry, uh, not one. We have two for the uniform. And then we have uh, elementary case five, which we have for a concentrated moment. So here we have, see it acting somewhere in the middle of the beam here, but it can also, if we had choose the appropriate value of A and B, uh, act on the endpoints. So going back, we find that the appropriate elementary cases are two and five. So let's go back. So elementary case two, we have the expression for the deflection given here. So we can simply insert that one. And now we have to find uh, the 
elementary case or the deflection curve for the second or for the first system here. Now let's take a look in the table. So we're down here. So let's look at our expression. So we have two constants, we have beta and alpha. And if we look in the bottom here, we remember that alpha and beta are related to A and B. That indicate at which point on the beam that our concentrated moment is located. And since we're after the case where our moment was at point A, then our corresponding alpha will be zero and our corresponding B will be L, meaning that alpha is also zero and beta is equal to one. So we need to set beta equal to one in this case, and then alpha equal to zero. And then we get this, again, this, uh, the funny bracket we need to identify. So since alpha is zero, then we will always have the case where xi is larger than alpha or equal to, but that means that we will have to have this value inserted. So that's important to remember. Always tricky to evaluate the, this uh, funny bracket, so don't underestimate the task here. Okay, so we can insert. And we just need to make sure that our sign is also correct. Let's just take so our MA points in this direction. And we see that matches with M0 here. So inserting this, we get xi and then we get two. What was the evaluation of the term with the beta coefficient? And then we get xi to the power three. And then we have this bracket, which then becomes three xi squared, like this. Okay, so these expressions we of course need in the end. When we add them together, we get the total deflection curve for the entire loading case. Uh, we still of course need in the process to find out what MA is. So that is going to be our first task. And as we remember from last time, uh, from the last way of doing it, we need to enforce our geometrical constraint. So what is our geometrical constraint? Well, before it was pretty obvious, it was that the deflection at point B was equal to zero. But our geometrical constraint, which we have removed in this case, is that now we have allowed rotation at point A here. But in reality, we have no rotation at point A. So that means our geometrical constraint in this case is that the rotation or the slope at, well, we can just write it up a little bit more elaborate here, xi equal to zero has to be equal to zero. Right, so we need to first find expressions for the slope of our deflection curve and then add the, them together and uh, set it to zero. Now, we don't have directly slope here from this these two expressions, but let's go back and look at our elementary cases to see if we can find something useful. And we can see for the first case here, we actually do get uh, from the first column here, we get an expression for the slope at point A. So we directly have the slope given here. And for the fifth elementary case here, we also have expressions here uh, for the slope. So we can actually insert them directly. So 
So the slope at zero or at point A from the elementary cases and for the second elementary case like this. So when we enforce the geometrical constraint that the total slope should be equal to zero we add these two together and we then ultimately find an expression for the moment at A. So this is our redundant load, redundant moment, which we have found by enforcing the geometrical constraint that we had removed in order to set up our two systems here. And now we can of course go on And we can express our total deflation curve now we insert our MA And simplifying the expression, we can indeed go back and recheck what we found from the last approach. We found the same expression here. So everything works out. Okay, so we have now seen that we actually have several methods uh, to treat such problems. And we have several, well, you can say it's the same method, but we have several approaches. We have seven ways of choosing our uh, geometrical constraint that we remove and then the corresponding um, redundant load moment or force. So just a little bit about uh, in detail about statical indeterminacy. Uh, so we can actually distinguish between externally statically indeterminate systems. Uh, these are the ones that we have typically seen where we realize that all our reaction forces and moments cannot be determined uh, by applying the equilibrium conditions. But there is actually also something uh, called internally stati statically de indeterminate systems where we actually can see that not all internal forces and moments can be determined. This is not something that we uh, will elaborate a lot on, but it's just uh, for your reference. Uh, good to know that there are actually these two different kinds of statical uh, indeterminate systems. Uh, but no matter, no matter which type of statically indeterminate system we have, we refer to the degree of statically indeterminacy uh, down here, that's the important thing, is the number of constraints that we need to remove in order to obtain the statically determinate system. So we will go on to another example, and this is of course going on a little bit more in the complex direction. So in this case, we will have a second degree statically indeterminate system, uh, which of course complicates in principle, not the theory here, but uh, the practical computations that we need to carry out. So in this case, uh, we have again 
a beam with a clamp support at point A, and then we have two rolling supports at B and C. So our task in this problem is to calculate the beam slope, not the deflection, because, well, the deflection is zero at B and C, but the slope at point B. So, here we have it. So, we take uh, the obvious choice. You can say that uh, our zero system is found by removing the two supports and B and C. Then we get a statically determinant zero system. But then we have to add now two uh, extra systems, one for each uh, constraint that we have removed. So now we refer to the two extra systems as the one system or first system. And the second system. So again, just like in the last example, we need to identify the appropriate elementary cases. Again, noting that we have a constant bending stiffness so that we can indeed do so. Now let's go back. So the zero system, note the load here. So we can see that we have this case exactly what we are after. So it's elementary case eight and the other ones are both elementary case six. So now let's write up what we actually need from the elementary cases. So remember in this case, we are actually not asked to find the uh, deflection curve in the end. So we can already jump a bit ahead and uh, think what we actually need from the elementary cases. So let's just go back to the previous example. Not this approach, but this one. Uh, so what was it that we actually needed in order to have enforced the geometrical constraints where we needed the deflections at the point where we had the uh, the removed constraints, right? So what we do need in this case is of course to express uh, the deflections at point B and point C because those are the ones that we then need to enforce zero deflections in these points in order to find the unknown forces BY and CY. So we will directly write up So here I've written the deflection for the zero system at point one half. So for xi equal to one half corresponding to point B. So if we do that, well, let's just go back and see what we actually need to insert. This is quite a lengthy expression but we can quite easily from the definition of the load here now see that A and B are both one half, well, L half, and that means that alpha and beta are both uh, one half. And then we can use uh, this expression and insert in this expression. Still being a little bit careful with the brackets here. But doing that, we finally get well, let me write up 
few of the intermediate steps here. And that way you can redo the calculations and you can check the intermediate steps as well. So I get minus four, one half, one eight, plus six times one half, times two minus one half, times one fourth. And simplifying that expression gives us finally seven Q zero L four divided by 192. The second thing I need is the deflection still for the zero system, but at point one, which corresponds to point C uh, in my figure. Here I get one half raised to the power four minus four times one half plus six times one half times two minus one half like that. And that gives me 41 Q0 L4 divided by 384. So of course I need to do the same two uh, same things for both my first system and my second system. So this ha there is a bit of calculations involved in doing this. So my first system evaluated at point half. Uh, the elementary cases here we have already seen uh, a few times. Uh, so let me just directly write it up. So here again, we have to be careful about um, the sign. So we have by minus by. Inserting into the elementary case, here we get three times one quarter times one half minus one eighth. And finally, we get minus by L3 divided by 24. I should just emphasize here that it's extremely easy to make a mistake uh, when you read out these uh, read out these numbers in the elementary cases. So please take a bit of time and do things twice, or just really take it easy. Uh, as if you if you rush it, then things will go wrong. Oops, it's a mistake. So it should be minus five by L3 divided by 48. Now we're almost done. So we just need the last two ones or the last two ones for the second system. So what we get is minus CY L third six minus one 
minus 1 8 minus 5 cy So a little bit in funny note here is that you can see it's not really relevant uh, for the calculations here, but you can see that we have the same expression here as we have expressions here. And that's actually showing one of the, actually a main fundamental principle in mechanics is that if you excite with a load here and measure the response out here, it's the same as acting with a load out here, measuring the response at the other side. So we have this uh, correspondence principle. As I said, it's not really relevant for this exercise, but if you had seen it, which then you could have avoided doing one of the calculations. But anyway, it's more safe to do the calculations again, I think. Okay, so for the second one, let me just write it up directly. We get minus CY L3 divided by 3. So in order to enforce the geometrical constraints, well, we see here now that what we have is that the deflection at point B, oxi equal to one half is equal to zero. Deflection at point C or psi equal to one is also zero. So inserting that into the previous, we get finally the uh, conditions. So the first equations in the two unknowns, by and cy, and we get the second equation. So these are two equations with two unknowns, and these can be solved either by hand or using Mabel. And we get by equals to 19 over 56 Q0L, and cy equal to 12 over 56 Q0 times L. So what we remember is that we were actually asked, let me go back, We were actually asked to find the slope here on the point B. Uh, so we're not going to take the calculations always through all the way through because, uh, well, it's just too lengthy. But let's see the approach here. So as I said, we're not going to take it all the way through, but I'm going to point to one thing that is a little tricky and that we have to take uh, be a little bit careful when we apply the elementary cases uh, when finding the slope. So if we write up one of the contributions to the deflection curve first, uh, the one from the zero system, of course, in order to find the total deflection curve, we need to add also from the two other systems, which we could do now because we have both BY and CY, but it will just fill up too much space. But if we write up the first contribution, We write it up, then we get so this is valid um, only in the case where we are looking at the point 
up to point B because we have this bracket which we have to take into account. Well, but that's not the main point. Here, the main point is that when we want to find the slope, so how do we actually define the slope? So the slope is defined as dw dx, but what makes it tricky now, and what I want to point out, is that this curve is in terms of the dimensionless actual coordinate, the xi parameter, which is not x, so we have to be a little bit careful. So what we can write, that we can differentiate with respect to xi, but then we also have to multiply by the xi dx in order to make this work. And by the definition of the dimensionless coordinate, which is given as x over l, we can see that this expression the second expression here is actually equal to L. So my main point here is that when we differentiate our expressions from the elementary cases in order to find the slope, we need to multiply it by this extra factor in order to get the correct value. And that's a little bit tricky. Well, it's not tricky to do, but it's tricky to remember to do that. So let's say, Let's do it here. So we can easily differentiate this expression with respect to xi. But then what we really want, if we want to find the slope, is we want to find EI. This is the slope. Then we need In order for this to, to work, we need to multiply by our uh, by by L in this case. So sorry, I just realized a small mistake, but we can easily fix that. This was not L. This was one over L. I thought there was something wrong with the dimensions. So this also means that we need to divide by L here. Okay, and we can also see that if we were looking at the dimensions and the units, we need q0 times l to the power of 3 in order for the dimensions to be correct. And this we would have not have catched if we had just differentiated our expression with respect to xi up here and not remembering this extra factor. Of course, we didn't solve the complete problem of finding the slope at point b because we need not only this expression with xi equal to one half inserted, we also need the expressions for the two other loads, by and cy inserted and evaluated, but this is a rather lengthy expression. And the main difficulty is actually remembering to do exactly this in order to get the right expression for the slope. So we will take the final example, which is a little bit more complex example. Um, and we have the system shown here. So we have a simple support and two rolling supports here and two external loads acting on the system. So is the system statically indeterminate? Yes, it is. Well, one could actually easily be a little bit mistaken here and say, okay, I 
since I have uh, I don't have I know how I don't have any vertical or there are only three uh, support reactions here verticals of forces so why can I determine these well I have to remember that when we say that we only have three equilibrium equations available that also takes the horizontal force equilibrium into equation or into account meaning that when we see here already now that we do not have any horizontal forces in our system, then we have already implicitly used one of our equilibrium conditions, meaning that we only have two left. And that means we cannot determine the three unknown support reactions uh, from these two unknowns, uh, uh, from these two equations. So it is one time statically indeterminate. To solve this system, we could use a straightforward approach taking the vertical support reactions and using these as redundant loads but we will show here that it's also possible to do things differently and we will actually use an internal force or internal load which is the internal moment at point b as the redundant load so the geometrical constraint that we are then uh sort of removing is that the two systems, since we do not have this internal force, then we also have a sort of a disconnected system here. So that we both have the, we have the support here. So we have zero deflection at point B, but since we don't have any moment at point B, which means we can have free rotation around point B. So the beams left and right of point B can rotate independently. And they will sort of now have a kink and that will be the, the system that we then solve for this is not straightforward to to see that this is a possibility but let's try and see what what happens if we use this uh, system to solve our system so this is our full system and we will now write up the two systems So this will be our zero system, meaning that the two parts of the beam left and right of point B, uh, they somehow act as being disconnected because they don't have this common uh, rotation at point B. We have no moment at point B, so they rotate independently of each other at point B. So it actually looks like this. We might as well separate them. So that is, will be our zero system. And our one system, our first system, will then be to add this moment that we have uh, actually neglected. like this so now we can go on um, and of course uh, what we need to uh, use as a geometrical constraint is something with the slope at point B because we know that slope it is a connected beam in in reality so the slope at point B will be continuous so we need to evaluate the slope at point B but let's first uh, find the elementary cases. So we will have elementary case one and we will have elementary case five. And 
and what we want to do is to evaluate the slope at point B. So we take the zero system first. And event, sorry. And evaluate the slope at point B. Uh, but what we can see here is that we actually complicate it by the fact that uh, we can both evaluate for point B to the left of point B and to the right of point B. So I will call to the left of point B, I will call minus. And that means I will be looking at this system. So let me just write it up. This is B minus, this is B plus. This is B minus, this is B plus. So first I will look at the system and writing up the slope at the right point. Doing that and noting uh, these dimensions down here, A uh, defined like this. Looking at the elementary cases, I get minus F A squared divided by four. But I can of course also evaluate the slope at the B plus point for the same zero system. So looking at this one over here, Get F A squared divided by two. So now I can do the same for the first system, meaning these two cases over here. Now I call them one, I call them still the slope and then B minus, I get minus two MA over three. And for the other case, I get two MA over three. So now I have expressions for both my zero system, my first system, for the left and the right points uh, corresponding to point B. So what is my geometrical constraint? Well, my geometrical constraint is that I know that my slope is continuous, right? I know that my slope just to the left and just to the right of point B are identical. So I can use that to set up my equations. So I know that my EI B minus plus EI So this is my slope at B minus. Well, that must be equal to my slope at B plus. Oops, this should be zero and this should be Y. So putting all this together gives the condition that my MA equals minus nine over 16 F times A, like this. 
So now we have found the redundant load, but let's look back at the exercise to see what we were actually asked to find. The redundant load was necessary to find in order to find any other quantity in the problem. So let's see. So we were asked first to find the support reactions, meaning the vertical forces at A, B and C, and then finally the deflection at point B. So let's find the support reactions. Uh, so now we have made the problem statically determinant actually by finding the internal moment at point B. So now we can use pure statics. We have to be a little bit careful. Uh, but let's look at the two systems here. I've just split up. This is what we uh, have now found. We have found MA. And now we can use that uh, by looking at statics. So for instance, for the left beam and the right beam, we can have uh, moment equations. So if we take the moment around point B for uh, this problem, let's take a moment equilibrium. Then we have MA, we have plus F times A and we have minus ay times 2a. If we solve for ay, in this case, we get ay equal to 7 divided by 32 times f. And for the right problem here, we can do the same. We can take the moment equilibrium. Now, I suddenly realized that I call this ma uh, it should actually be MB, of course. I don't know why I called it MA. Let me look back and see if I've called it MA the whole time. Yeah, for some reason I called it MA. I apologize for that. Doesn't really make sense. So let me just write it up here. It should have been called MB. Well, let me just keep it. All right, so we take again here the uh, moment equilibrium around point B. For the right system, we get Cy times 2A minus 2F times A minus MA equals to zero, meaning that our Cy, in this case, takes the value 23 over 32 point F. So now we're only missing the vertical support reaction at point B. So here it's easiest to just look at the complete system now. AY we have already found. CY we have already found. F we have. 2F here. BY we are needing. Vertical force equilibrium tells us that AY plus BY plus Cy minus 3F equals to zero. And if we do some calculations, we find that our By is then sixty-six over thirty-two times F. So that means that we have found all support reactions Ay Cy and by. So the final question was to find the deflection at point D and just to show point D it's actually this point right so we can look at the beam over here So here, in this case, we need to have two super uh, two elementary cases uh, in order to evaluate the deflection at point B. We need the case where we have a force in the center, and we have a moment at the left end, and then we evaluate for the midpoint, meaning psi equal to one half. And doing that, Inserting the two elementary cases, we get finally 37 over 192 
f times a to the power of 3. Of course, if we specifically ask for WD, then we have to divide by the bending stiffness, right? But that's a small thing. Okay. So now we have seen a couple of different approaches to solving the problem. Uh, the method is the same that we introduce. We remove some geometrical constraints. We enforce uh, the redundant loads, either moments, uh, internal, external, or forces, which could be both be internal and external, uh, and in general solve the problem, uh, hopefully using the elementary cases if they're available. And then we enforce the geometrical constraints in order to determine these redundant loads and then we can solve the problem depending on what we actually asked for. Now, uh, the exercises, uh, well, there is one that's really, it's a big exercise. It's the approach that you can take. There are many approaches. I would suggest that you take the one that we just saw, uh, and I'm meaning this exercise, the big one here. I think it's most easily solved by using uh, the internal moments at point C and point E uh, and to introduce these uh, as the redundant loads in this case. It can also be done with uh, vertical forces, but then you have to be extra careful uh, with several cases, with well, several things. Well, both approaches are valid but uh, and possible. The solution that would be uploaded is done with the internal moments at C and E as the redundant loads. So I would encourage you to use that approach. Um, yeah. So that's that's kind of a big task. So if you can do this one, I think you can do almost everything uh, in, uh, in the case of redundant loads. Uh, so uh, that's definitely a good test case. Um, yeah, and then we have another exercise down here, which is more in the case of uh, using... Uh, well, here we don't have the constant EI and it's also a statically determined problem. So you, you, this is this is testing a bit differently. Um, yeah, uh, so I think this is it. Uh, next week, as I said, will be about composite beams. So that's moving on uh, to a to a quite a different topic. So thank you for this time.